war against drugs is heating up. I think they should have wrote prison guard on my forehead when I was born because it just fits me. I say he's a criminal. Let him go to prison. I have a life and 30 years sentence. 20 years for drug trafficking. I have life without parole for three ounces of methamphetamine. Of the 2,600 people I've sent to federal prison, I've seen three or four kingpins. We're incarcerated poor people who are drug addicts. You're watching poor, uneducated people be fed into a machine like meat to make sausage. Law enforcement agencies get rewarded in cash for the sheer numbers of drug arrests. My money's ours now. That's my money now. Eugene Jarecki is an author and a filmmaker, the director behind Freakonomics, The Trials of Henry Kissinger, Why We Fight, and most recently, The House I Live In. The House I Live In, his documentary about the drug war, leaves one thinking that nothing will ever change. And yet it did. On election night, voters in Colorado and Washington state voted to legalize recreational marijuana, and voters in California passed a ballot initiative to end that state's controversial mandatory minimum law, three strikes and you're out. Eugene Jarecki sees possibilities for more, and you can be part of it. We talked right after the election of 2012. In Washington and Colorado, we saw victories on the legalization of marijuana. And as the maker of a movie about the drug war, that's very important to me because um, I think those victories demonstrate a certain frailty in the system and they demonstrate a public appetite for uh, going about this differently, for starting to recognize that the way we've dealt with drugs over the past 40 years has been a disaster and that we need a, a, a course correction. Um, in the state of California, the victory was almost more significant because Californians, as it turns out, voted 68% to revise the notorious three strikes law in California. Prior to election day, uh, the three strikes law in California could put you in jail for the rest of your life for a third strike that was petty or nonviolent, as trivial as stealing a slice of pizza or stealing denture cream or socks, as one person got a life sentence for. When you see such an absurd law as that finally get addressed by the public who voted to say, henceforth, under what was called Prop 36, uh, California law has now been changed so that the third strike that puts you in jail for life has to be serious or violent, the way we would think. Duh. Like, that's what we would think should put you in jail for life. But that hadn't been the case for uh, decades, and now it is the case. And I think that sends a message across the country, not only that California, which led the nation into draconian sentencing, that they can begin to lead us out toward a more sane place. But for anyone who doesn't care about the humanity of it, it'll save the state over $100 million a year. And I want to see that message spread to other state governments who are hemorrhaging money and themselves have excessive sentencing policies in the drug war. Remind us quickly, you talk about it, you, you documented in your film, The House I, I Live In. How did the U.S. come to spend a trillion dollars and on what? And where are we in the rank of the world's nations when it comes to mm -hmm. jailing citizens? Well, I can't, I can't underscore just how disastrous the drug war has been. We've been at this for 40 years. It's our longest war. We've spent a trillion dollars. We've had 45 million drug arrests. And what do we have to show for it? A record of abject failure. Drugs are cheaper, purer, more available than ever before. And we have the world's largest prison population in real numbers, 2.3 million people behind bars, and of course more of our citizens behind bars than any other nation as well. And so you look at the numbers and they speak of such a tragic uh, error and misguided policy that the question is, you know, how long will it take until it dawns on our policymakers, what the American people I think increasingly know, which is that this is a gigantic waste of money at a time where we can't afford a waste of money, and it is denigrating a cross-section of our population, particularly minorities and particularly poor people, particularly people of color, um, and has been doing so for decades to the incredible detriment of that community and the detriment of ourselves and our standing in the world. But you document how we got here mm -hmm. through the, the private interest of corporations involved, the public interest of politicians sure. to get elected, the popularity of a get tough on crime, and then the perpetuating, self-perpetuating uh, nature of this criminalization of a whole section of the population, yeah. excluding them from um, gainful employment, even safe housing, you name it. What happened? I mean, with that kind of machine pushing in one direction, how did voters in California, Colorado, Washington say stop? Well. To put this in sort of five easy pieces, uh, we can look at the drug war in the following way. We've had drug laws going back in this country to the 1800s. The first drug laws we saw were opium laws that were uh, sort of, lo and behold, uh, 
targeted very much at just Chinese immigrant populations coming to America. In a way, we saw that these were really thinly veiled laws of racial control. We made opium illegal, but only in California, and only the way Chinese people were taking it, which was to smoke it. Everywhere else in the country, it was legal. So we were very selective with our opium laws, and we used it to harass and incarcerate Chinese immigrants. That gave way to a new chapter in the Mexicanization of hemp was suddenly renamed marijuana so that we could use it as what we called Mexican opium to stop and detain Mexicans in new and, and startling numbers. Uh, chapter by chapter, we've seen drug laws in the history of this country really be thinly veiled laws of racial control. But it wasn't until 1971 that this was declared a war. Richard Nixon stood in front of the American people and declared a war on drugs. And when he did that, he unleashed the dogs of war. So what had been an ad hoc series of improvised laws over time suddenly got codified into a national policy and a national policy on a wartime footing. And of course, what does a wartime footing imply? It implies all the horrors of war. The, uh, the incredible casualties, the mass scale, and the entrenched economic and bureaucratic interests that arise around that sense of a threat. So the moment you could now say, this is not just a little group here or there, but this is you know, public enemy number one, as Richard Nixon called drug abuse. Well, you can't declare war on a substance like drugs any more than you could declare war on terror. The war on terror was a war on people we associate with terrorist activities. The war on drugs was a war we on people we associate as being involved with drugs. And that ended up being a very very specific, very targeted, racially targeted, and ultimately economically targeted cross-section of our population. So that has been so destructive to that group that the question is, how does this machine gather the critical mass that it has gathered to uh, basically continue despite its record of incredible failure? And that's where it has really become clear that it's an unholy alliance between those in the corporate sector who prey upon our fellow citizens for profit because they need a flood of bodies coming through the system that they need to feed, house, provide phone service, provide meal service, provide all that kind of thing. And so there's a profiteering engine on the basis of people, on the backs of people. But then, of course, they need the help of those in Congress to make the laws that create the flood of bodies. So you have Congress people who basically work for those corporate interests and they tell the public scary things that are meant to make us vote for tough on crime laws. And those tough on crime laws are really just ways of ensuring that flood of bodies flow going through the system, that we have tougher and tougher laws that keep people in for longer and longer, for less and less violence, for less and less serious so crime. I go at, so I go back to my question of what changed. I mean, we have more and more competition over um, right. living wages and quality jobs. We have more and more racial anxiety yep. as the demographics of this country changed. Politicians haven't changed. Yep. What did? Well, I think more and more Americans are, are either drug users or are very familiar with a drug user. How many of us know somebody who's an addict? And is our natural response when our friend comes to us and say, I've had a relapse or I'm hooked on this substance or that, is the first thing we do to call the police? No, it's just not common sense. That's not what any of us would do. We would try to find a soft landing for the person, a medical person or a, uh, or a, a help group or an anonymous group or something. We would try to find something that actually helps that person find a path forward. So none of us would really, with what we now know about addiction, which is far more than we knew 40 years ago, with what we now know about all of our addictions, we all have addictions, none of us would see that that's the right way to do it. So now, the trail of failure, the economic disaster of it, and our own sense that we've come of age and it doesn't make sense as a public policy, that's all coming together to mean that the public taste, which demonstrated itself in Colorado and Washington in those victories, and then in the California victory about three strikes, all of those demonstrate that the public is shifting in their sense of this as a priority. And hopefully they're shifting to, rem to remember that drug abuse is and always was a, a health matter, a personal health matter and perhaps a public health matter. It was never a matter for criminal justice. It was never appropriate to send somebody who has an addiction into the arms of a police officer when they should have been sent into the arms of a doctor or a healthcare professional. We could learn that now because I think the American people are more ready for it than ever before. We should be clear, voters in Colorado and Washington State voted to regulate marijuana, but regulate recreational marijuana in the same way that alcohol is regulated, sure. to, to, to sort of amp back. Um, what happens next? And what happens next in the uh, struggle in California around uh, mandatory minimums and sentencing? 
Well, I think these are small victories, and I think we have to be very careful not to let small victories woo us into any sense of false comfort. It's sort of like, if you think about the need for a revolution, and we need a revolution in the war on drugs, we need to absolutely throw this thing out, relegate it to the ash heap of history, and start again with real information about what drugs really do, about how they really affect human health, and about what to be afraid of and what not, and about how to treat people. So we need a revolution. But when you want a revolution, it's sort of like a pot of water on the stove with a cover. It starts to boil, and it really needs to boil. And at a certain point, it's got to blow up in order for the real meaning of change to take hold. Because what happens instead is that small victories like this, which have a benefit, their benefit is they show that the system is vulnerable and they're an indicator, like a shot across our bow, of what public opinion is. So that's helpful in that way. But the danger is, of course, each time you have a small victory like that, it's as if you let a little bit of steam out of the pot. And all that means is you delay the moment of explosion. You delay the moment of a serious overhaul because people tend to think, oh, well, that drug war, didn't that get fixed in Colorado and Washington? I think, we're, I think that's fine. It's on the road to recovery because Americans are busy. We're over overworked already, so we're just looking for a way to put any issue out of our mind. They keep stacking them up. Every time we turn around, there's a new part of our society that's really calling out for attention as a, as a dire situation. So we want to be able to go back to sleep, but we can't go back to sleep. This is only the beginning, and people have to recognize that these victories show some vulnerability, and are then an indicator of how important it is to continue the fight to end the drug war. Why do you feel so strongly <clears throat> about this? And who in your movie surprised you most? I mean, look, I grew up at a time in America in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement, for, where for a lot of young people like me who came out of a Jewish Holocaust past, um, my parents fled Nazi Germany on one side and the Tsars of Russia on the other. And they came to America and they taught the boys in my family that uh, we're all boys, and they, they taught us that our lives would sort of only make sense if they were devoted to social justice here in America as we had not, uh, as we had not enjoyed it in Europe, and that we were supposed to be messengers about the kind of su suffering that we and others endured. So uh, my life has been really a story of trying to live up to that legacy and try to be a messenger about, about uh, uh, the dangers to democracy that can arise in societies and, to, and dangers to human dignity. So I'm driven by something that goes way back in, my, in myself. Um, in terms of the American experience, I then grew up in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement where I watched the, pro the promise of the movement in many ways not take hold. That for young African Americans all around me when I was growing up, um, I thought we were all on the same footing. I thought it would turn out the same way for all of us. And I found myself very blessed finding opportunities in my life that were terrific and inspiring and a, a world of possibilities. And I found that they weren't. They were finding obstacle after obstacle that included tremendous brushes with the criminal justice system and a very disproportionate uh, set of laws and approaches by law enforcement. And as I began to see that in this system of mass incarceration that was overtaking the black community, it's what Michelle Alexander has recently called in her book, The New Jim Crow. I saw a new Jim Crow emerging in my own way, and I wanted to do something about it. Well, I did by trying to go across the country to about 25 states and talk to people at all levels of the system, from the drug dealer and drug user to the family member, the community, the cop, the judge, the warden, you know, everybody up and down the sort of family tree of those involved in the drug war. And what I have to tell you is that <clears throat> what I found is that everybody's a victim. I thought I was going to find winners and losers, heroes and villains, that kind of black and white stuff that like movies are made of. But it made it harder to make the movie because every time I found anybody, it turned out they had a deep story with the war on drugs. Even if they were a jailer or a warden or a cop, they weren't immune from the, the broad brush that this war on drugs has painted with. It's hurt their lives. It's degraded what they do for a living. It's often hurt their own family members who are on the other side of, on the receiving end of the laws. But by and large, I found that they all were crying out for reform, that amazingly, inside the system, <clears throat> there is this human majesty where people, you know, a cop would tell me from the front seat of his patrol car, I don't agree with what I'm doing, I'm arresting the same people day in, day out, week in, week out, this isn't working. Then I would get inside uh, the courtroom and the judge would tell me from his bench, he would cry out for uh, saner sentencing laws because Congress is passing mandatory minimum laws that take away the discretion of a judge. We think judges make the decisions. They don't. In the, in the majority of cases, a judge has a prescribed sentence that he has to give. He's basically a rubber stamper with his hands tied. And so many judges told me that and did so from their chambers, you know. And then 
of course, then I would go into the prisons themselves, where you would find, like, Security Chief Mike Carpenter, who's a fellow inside a uh, prison in Oklahoma, an amazingly thoughtful, deep-thinking person, who I first thought was a caveman. And it took sitting down with him to discover, no, this guy has a very deep appreciation of what he's doing and of what's wrong with the system that he's functioning in. And all of these voices inspired me enormously, because they say to me that if people inside the system can, f can take the tremendously courageous step of from the place where they, their, their very job and livelihood itself is vulnerable, of speaking out and asking for reform, then for the rest of us, it should be, it should be our daily work to pursue such reform.